And the length of the path that they can follow before they hit another molecule is called the mean free path. So lambda is the mean free path, and it's related to the number of molecules in the gas um, divided by the volume of the gas times 2 pi r d, where d is the um, molecular diameter, the diameter of the molecule. Now, I'm not going to derive this. You can read it in your book. All I'm going to do is kind of argue why this makes sense. Only the 2 is under the radical? Yeah, only the 2 is under the radical. Let's just see why this makes sense. This quantity, the number of molecules divided by the volume, what's that? That's sort of the density. Yeah. That's how, how many molecules there are in a unit volume. Well, if that number gets bigger, then you're going to hit things, you're going to travel less distance before you hit something. Because in any given unit volume, there's more molecules. So it makes sense that the mean free path would be inversely proportional to the density of molecules. The more molecules you have, the less distance you'll travel before you hit something. It's also inversely proportional to the diameter. Because the bigger the molecule, the more likely it is that they'll hit each other because they're just they're bigger. And, and so they just provide bigger targets to hit. So the fact that the mean free path is inversely proportional to the, how closely things are packed and their size makes sense. Now let's see if we can kind of figure out where this pi and this d squared came from. If you think of the molecules, and we'll just do kind of a simplified discussion of this. If you think of the molecules and we're just going to focus on one molecule. Here's the two molecules with their diameter. Well, let me just focus on one molecule and think of all the other molecules as if they were points. Shrink them down to a point, but shrink the one molecule that's moving up to a distance of 2D. Then I really haven't changed anything. The, the same collision size is the same. So. I take this molecule, I'm going to say, this is the molecule that's moving. All of the others are fixed in space, and they've shrunk down to a point, but this one's grown to be 2D. So I really haven't changed anything. This molecule that's moving is still going to go through, and they're going to hit things. Then as this molecule is moving with some velocity v, it traces out a cylinder whose cross-sectional area, since it's a diameter, the area of this cylinder is pi, squared. pi times d squared, because the radius is d. And then its length is v <coughs> delta t. So that's the size of this cylinder. How many of these little dots are inside that cylinder? Well, I know the number of dots per unit volume. That's just n divided by v. So if I multiply the volume of the cylinder times the density of the atoms, the other little dots, that tells me how many collisions I'm going to have inside that cylinder. Now, how long is the path I traveled? Well, the path I traveled is that length. So. I had, I traveled a path that was V delta T long, and inside that path, I had this many collisions. So that meant that, on average, the distance I traveled, those two things cross out, and I get pi D squared this, I don't get the square root of 2. Now the square root of 2 comes in when I relax all that, you know, let the other molecules move, and you can read in your book, this is all on page. 515. The square root of 2 shows up when you let the other molecules move and shrink them back down. But this just gives you a sense for where all these quantities came from, with the exception of the square root of 2. The square root of 2 pops out when you let everything move. So that tells you how far something moves inside the gas. That's its mean free path. Now the last thing we can talk about 
is I said that the molecules were, we've been talking about the molecules in terms of their average speed, but they move at different speeds. They, the speeds are distributed. So what does that distribution look like? Well, Clerk Maxwell, the same physicist that developed a lot of electricity and magnetism theory, also looked into this, and he determined that the distribution of speeds, which this is the probability of any atom having a speed of v. So this is a probability distribution. The probability of some atom having a speed v, and here's the speed, looks like this. So here's the probability distribution. And here it's graph. Okay? M is the molecular mass of the graph, R is the constant, T is the temperature, and V is the molecular speed. So if I want to know how likely is it for an atom to have a particular speed, pick one here, then I'd plug that in here, do the math, and it would give me a probability. You can see that some speeds are highly probable. Some speeds aren't so probable. Very low speeds have low probability. Very high speeds have high probability. And the probability is dependent on temperature. So you can then ask interesting questions about what is, what is the average speed? Have any of you had any probability theory at all? To find an average speed, then, how would you do that? Well, it just doesn't look like a normal curve to me if that's where you're going with this. But any average is found. It's just like a weighted average. But instead of doing a sum and weighting it by the probability, since this is a function, you've got to do an interval. So the probability of finding speeds between here is the area under this curve, right? So the probability of finding speeds in this little interval dv is going to be the area under this curve. So this is dv and this is v. This is pv. So if I want to know the average under that region, then I take the quantity I want to know the average of times the probability distribution. So if I want to know the average of V, I look at V, weight it by the probability of V occurring, and then integrate from 0 to infinity. So if I want to know the most probable speed, or the average speed, rather, the average speed, then I look at all the speeds weighted by the probability of that speed occurring, and then add them all up, integrate them from zero to infinity, all possible speeds. And when you do that, you discover that the average speed is the square root of 8RT over pi m. You just do that interval. I'm not going to do it. You can do it. You want? This is the average speed. Average V. Now, let's get the average of V squared. The average V squared, if I take the square root of that, I'd get the root V squared speed, right? So this is going to be, the average V squared is going to be the V squared weighted by the probability, dv, integrated from 0 to infinity. And when I do that, I get this is equal to 3 rt over m. And if I take the square root of that, I get the RMS speed, like I got before. So this probability distribution will give me the RMS speed equation I got before. Finally, how would I find the most probable speed in the distribution? What's the most probable speed? The one that has the highest probability for 
How would I find that on the distribution? That's the maximum. So how would I find a formula for that maximum? What would I need to do? Take the derivative. So I take the derivative of this with respect to v and then do what? Set it to zero. So the most probable speed, I take d, p of v, with respect to v and set it to zero. And when you do that, what you find out is the most probable speed is going to be the square root of 2 rt over n. So notice, as the temperature changes, the most probable speed changes. So at very low temperatures, the most probable speed is going to be down here. And you get a distribution that's peak like that. As you increase temperature, the most probable speed is going to go up in temperature, and the distribution will spread out. So you can just look at that distribution and see that the distribution, its peak changes with temperature. So its peak moves to the right with temperature, and the distribution widens with temperature. So that's the characteristic of the distribution. Okay, now, let's stop for a minute here and just do a couple problems. Then we'll wrap up with um, ideal gases and go on to those isothermal pro or the processes. But I just wanted, so that was a lot of information. Let's be sure we've got it. So we've got an ideal gas at a temperature of minus 20 Celsius. So first of all, let's find its average kinetic energy. So let's write this up here. So the average kinetic energy was 3 halves KT. Again, T must be in Kelvin, and now you can kind of see why. The Kelvin scale was developed because of this relationship. Because as Kelvin, as temperature, Kelvin temperature goes to zero, absolute zero, the average kinetic energy goes to zero. The Kelvin scale reflects the correct relationship between temperature and motion. Yeah. I want to make sure that I'm making what seems like it might be an important connection. All the ideal gases are non -tomic. No. 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 And we'll talk about how these things would change if you have a diatomic or a polyatomic ideal gas okay. in just a minute. But some of the formulas only apply to ideal, to monatomic gases. So the formula I've derived so far for internal energy only applies to a monatomic. This is true for any ideal gas. Okay. And we'll talk about the difference between the two in just a second. I'll, I'll be there in, in, well, not a second, but I'll be there pretty soon. So, in this case, the average Ke, then, is going to be 3 halves times Boltzmann's constant, 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules per Kelvin. And so then we'll, I have to make the minus 20 Celsius Kelvin. So what's that? 253.253. So now you see the Kelvin and the Kelvin cancel out, and you're left with this. Anybody punch that out yet? New. That's the average kinetic energy of one molecule. Now, what's the total translational kinetic energy of the gas if the number of moles is? Now, this one is translational energy is 3 nRT over 2. NRT. 3 has NRT. So, again, Well, actually, you don't even have to do that. Um, you'll get the same thing, but 
I've given you the number of moles, right? So it's 2.0 moles. How many particles are in the mole? That divided by the number. Not divided by. Two moles has 6.0. Keep doing that backwards. Two times 10 to the 23rd particles per mole. So see, mole cancels out mole here. And then you know that there is that many 5.24 times 10 to the minus 21 joules per particle. So particle cancels out particle, mole cancels out mole. Multiply that all out, so you don't even have to use the energy formula. You could, you get the same thing. But you multiply these guys out, and you'll find out the total amount of energy. 